right. Well, hey, could we just thank Keith and Chad one more time for that? That was great. That's the truth about all of our stories, right? How many would say sometimes you get it right, sometimes you don't, right? Am I among my friends? That's great. Amen. That's great. And just and uh, talking about story, I have a story. So, Dylan proposed to Jessica, and she said yes. Boom. Some of y'all wonder, he's always at the sound booth, but I want to tell you, he's not always at the sound booth. <laughs> Do not want everybody to know that. Well, we're proud of you, buddy. That's great. Little shocked, but proud nonetheless. Anyhow, we love you. That's just great. Hey, honor him. He works so hard around here. He does. Love you. So this is a weekend when we're talking a lot about stories, and all of our lives are filled with the stories that are connecting one to another, and they comprise our lives, right? Our lives are just built upon stories. I was thinking about this in light of what I want to share with you today. So I am coming up on, I've been sharing with you kind of the nostalgia side of uh, my life these days, you know, thinking about moving into uh, some lines of demarcation for me as a pastor, you know, coming into 30 years as an ordained minister. 29 years ago, at the end of this month, Beth and I rolled into town uh, in Martin County, you may know, I've shared the story before, I began my ministry in Martin County. How many of y'all knew that? Uh, my parents were living down here in Palm Beach County, and we received a word. We're part of a sense system of uh, church governance. So uh, we don't, uh, church doesn't call us, a bishop sends us. And so I received a call that we were going to go to First Methodist Church in Stewart, and I was going to serve there as an associate pastor like Trevor's doing here at Community of Hope. And uh, when I found that out, I called my parents who were living in Palm Beach County, and they went to the church incognito to check it out. <laughs> That's what good parents do. And at the, end of the, at the end of the service, they introduced themselves to who would be my senior pastor, and he was so gracious. He was just a fantastic uh, mentor to me. And um, Pastor Joe walked him around the church and told him all these things. So they called me later and said, you know, you're going to be fine. Don't mess this up. This is a good opportunity. <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. And uh, so uh, we, at the end of May, we threw all of our belongings into a rider rental truck, and we drove to Palm Beach County, or uh, to Martin County, we were going to begin our ministry. And uh, I had finished seminary, I'd been ordained, and I was, I was trained, and I was ready to put it all into practice. I had all the answers, I knew everything I needed to do, and everything was absolutely fantastic for 30 days. It was awesome. And then I, uh, my, my senior pastor walked into my office, and one afternoon, he said, you got a minute, I want to talk to you. And I said, yeah, sure. And I went down to his office, and he said, hey, I want to remind you of something. Now, this is toward the end of June. He said, I want to remind you that he said, uh, I take July off. And I was thinking, that's okay, you're giving me a year head start. And he goes, no, I'm giving you a week head start. And by this time, I had already preached once, and I was into this rhythm, so she passed like, preach once a month. And I'm a rock star at once a month. But then I was going to preach four times in a row. And I was thinking, I, I don't know that much stuff to preach four times in a row. <laughs> and uh, the minute, so the, the week comes, he, he went out of town. And this was a congregation that had a segment of younger people in it. But it was primarily, it was a bit of an older congregation. Now, we, were, we were pretty young in the congregation. And the very first week we're out of town, uh, a precious saint in the church passed away. And uh, I thought, oh my gosh, uh, now i got to do a funeral. And my dad had bought me a, a, a blue suit. I'll never forget it. It didn't fit real well. It wasn't real comfortable. Man, I put that blue suit on, and I did the funeral. And I got home, and as soon as I got home, and Beth said, how did that go? I said, it went pretty well. The phone rang, and somebody else passed away. And over the course of the next month, I did 12 funerals. I'm not even making that up. 
And uh, my senior pastor who was at his little cabin in North Florida, he called me about the middle of July, and he, this is what he said to me. I got on, he got on the phone. I said, hey, hey, Joe, Joe, how are you? And he said, I got one question for you. I said, what? He goes, what are you preaching? People are dropping like flies. <laughs> Whatever you're doing, stop it. And, and I lived 30 days in that blue suit, and I would, I would visit... Think about this. I would visit in the hospital in the blue suit and people would look at me coming in and they would go, what are you doing here? They thought I was coming to tell them bad news. When that month got over, I had to get a different suit because people thought, you're like the Grim Reaper. And uh, the reason I share all of that with you this morning is because I want you to know that every story has these moments where within them the plot thickens, okay? And uh, how many of you have figured out your life does not run in a straight line, does it? It runs in twists and turns and curves and ups and downs and all over the places, and that's the kind of thing that comprises life. And I was thinking about this because um, writers and those who study this sort of thing refer to what is uh, called oftentimes the pitch of a story and they refer to what is refer, uh, called the narrative arc. And they say all of uh, stories, all good stories, have this moment where they become a little bit more defined. And there are parts within our stories, good parts, bad parts, and different parts, tragic parts, parts filled with celebration. And that is the stuff of life. And it's how we navigate those things, quite honestly, that make the difference between a good life and a life well lived. And we're in a series right now, we're knee deep in a series, we're calling Chapter 2 of Future with Hope, and we're talking about the difference that the resurrection of Jesus Christ can make in our lives. And we're using the book of Acts to help us. Remember, the book of Acts is the second letter that is written by the gospel writer Luke. And Luke writes both the gospel of Luke and the book of Acts. We're saying this a lot. He was the personal physician to the apostle Paul. And he wrote these letters so that we would grow in our certainty about the power of the resurrection of Christ to transform human experience. Whether you believe it or not, that's a part of why we're here. We're here because we have come to some at least anecdotal understanding that just if in case this is actually true, this holds within it great power to transform human experience, to make it not just a life, but a life well lived. And so our goal in this series is, is not really to tell you how the Christian faith works, it's to show you how it works. And there's a lot of learning in that while we're looking at other chapter two stories in the, in the book of Acts to help us. Part of our sideways goal is to confront popular myths and misunderstandings. It's to challenge, inspire, and help you figure out how to take your next right step toward a future with hope. And every one of us has a next right step we have to take. It might not look like the person's sitting next to you, but you have a next right step. The Holy Spirit is here. And the Holy Spirit is, is wanting you to figure out and here to help you figure out what is your next right step to grow in your faith so that you would not just live a life, you would live a life well lived. And so this weekend, I want to explore a story with you where uh, for the early church, it's part of that narrative arc and the plot thickens just a bit. And we're going to read this morning in Acts chapter 4, uh, a powerful story. And this story, here's what I want you to understand. This comprises the first persecution of the early church. Uh, and until then, uh, things had been going pretty well. But then we get to Acts chapter 4 and some things heat up. Now, the, the story actually goes through most of the chapter. I want us to focus this morning on 13 verses. So Acts chapter 4, verses 1 through 13. Here we go. Let's pick it up. It says this. Now the priests and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees came up to Peter and John while they were still speaking to the people. And they were greatly disturbed because the apostles were teaching the people, proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. 
And they seized Peter and John, and because it was evening, they put them in jail until the next day. But many who heard the message believed. And so the number of men who believed grew to about 5,000. Now, what, what uh, Luke is writing is saying it was even a much bigger crowd than that. That's just all the men that we were counting. So the next day, the rulers and the elders and the teachers of the law met in Jerusalem. Now, Annas, the high priest, was there, and so was Caiaphas, John Alexander, and others of the high priest family. They had Peter and John brought before them and began to question them, by what power or by what name did you do this? And they're referring to the healing of the lame man again. And then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers and elders of the people, if we are being called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a man who was lame and are being asked how he was healed, then know this, you and all the people of Israel, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. For Jesus is the stone you builders rejected, which has now become the cornerstone. And salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. And then verse 13, and when they saw the courage of Peter and John and they realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished. And they took note that these men had been with Jesus. Let's pray. Lord, in these moments for everyone here, for everyone listening online, I pray by your spirit that you would cause breakthrough in every human experience today. That, Lord, you might remove the barriers that we might see you more clearly. That we, we might stand down against, as Gabby has shared or as Keith has sung, the words that have been put against us. Maybe words we've told ourselves. Would you, in the name of Christ, do a new thing? For we pray in Jesus' name, and everyone said, amen. amen. So here's the thing. For the early church, this is what I think. They must have thought everything is going great for a month. <laughs> and I mean, if you kind of look at it, this is what happens up until now. Jesus is resurrected. The Holy Spirit empowers the church. The church explodes. Peter and John become a part of the first miracle. A lame man is healed. And everything is going great. And then you get to chapter 4, and the narrative arc turns. Something happens in the story. And it, as one of my friends says, it gets real in here. I, that was funnier last night. I don't I just want to make sure everybody understands. In fact, it happens, first of all, in verses 1 and 2. I want you to see this. Verse 1 and 2 says this. The priests and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees came up to Peter and John while they're speaking to the people. They were, if you're taking notes, circle this. I find it funny. They were greatly disturbed because the apostles were teaching the people, proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. Sometimes when you read the scripture, you got you to gotta, you gotta put yourself in the story. And when I read this, I kind of think it's funny because greatly disturbed is kind of an understatement to what happened. I looked up and one con commentator said this, it was a brouhaha, okay? Another commentator put it like this, all hell broke loose. Literally, spiritual forces pushing against what is happening in this moment. Now, here's what I want to tell you. Let's do a little history here. Let's do a little learning. Peter and John are hauled into what we would remember as the court of the Sanhedrin, okay? These were the leaders of the temple. This was a temple hierarchy in place. The Sadducees were what we might think of today as Jewish aristocrats who wielded extraordinary power in Jerusalem and among the Jewish people in general. They guarded the central shrine which was the most holy place in Judaism, which was the place where for a thousand years, the one true God promised to meet with his people. They were in charge of a sacrificial system by which God had promised to meet with his people. And now Jesus had raised from the dead and everybody unschooled and ordinary, hey everyone, that's you and me. We're invited in. At least somebody has to say amen to that. We get in. We're insiders. You ever gone to a place before somebody recognizes you and they said, 
Oh, hey, he's with us and you're ushered right in. Anybody? Nobody? Okay, you guys need to up your game a little bit. Okay, get out a little bit more. All right, and that's a powerful thing when that happens. Here's the thing. This is the court of the Sanhedrin and they were about to lose their power. And they knew it. Because real religion was replacing dead inherited faith and it was rolling like a train. Think with me about this. See, if you're here today and and you're just sitting in kind of this dead expression of faith, go ahead and do that if you want to. But that's not what I'm preaching. And that's not what this church is founded upon. It's founded on something way different than that. And it's founded on this kind of thing. And and when when I think about this story and I think about the parallel of what's going on here, and I connect it to what I want us to be thinking about in terms of navigating chapter two moments in our lives, there are two things that I want to pull out of this story that I want to ask you to keep in mind in your own life right now because it's valuable advice through the word of God, through the pen of the apostle or uh, the, the gospel writer Luke. Two things, here's the first one. Any chapter two story has to acknowledge, first of all, the presence of difficulty. Say that with me. The presence of difficulty. Every chapter two story will have its difficult moments. Jesus put it this way. In this world, you will have trouble. He doesn't say you might have trouble. He's not saying it might get rough. The the storm surge may roll in. He's saying this. It will happen. But then I love the second part of that verse. He says, but be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. Just like my first month in ministry, sometimes, you know, there's smooth sailing for a little while, but then there comes this moment, writers would say, where there's an arc in the narrative and the story gets more complex, the characters get more defined, the villain begins to emerge, and it gets tense. This past week, uh, my best friend uh, in the ministry came over and he brought his team. They're a multi-site church. They have five campuses, and they do live preaching like we're, we're planning with Good Shepherd and all of that. And, and he, he said, hey, I want to come, come over, and I want you to talk about how you guys live your mission. And you know, our church has a particular mission. It's the focus of everything that we do. We believe that we exist as a church. You can say it if you remember it, to interest disinterested people in Jesus Christ and grow together into fully devoted followers of him. And so he brought, he brought these pastors over and, and some of them are in new settings. And they haven't been there very long. And for some of them, it's hard. Being a pastor, can I just say, it's a hard work. You guys are a hard group of people. I want to say it. Some of you more than others. Okay? All right? Try not to point at anybody in the room. <laughs> and he said, I just want you to remind, I just want you to talk to them about your experience. And can I just tell you why I love doing that? And, and I want to say this. I hope, I hope you hear this the way it's intended. There's just, our church right now is just in a fantastic place. God is just doing some great things in our church. You can <laughs> applaud. Give, he gets all the credit. But I want, to, I want to tell you why I love to talk to people. It's really not, it's not really about that. It's really mostly because I remember when it wasn't. And, 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 and the part of our good story actually began. I know some of you have been with me a long time. You may say you're, you're overstating this. I don't think I am. Was when we weren't doing well was when, honestly, it looked like we were failing. And, and I'll never forget that we, we were attracting a lot of people in our church in the early days. I mean, at one point, we were almost half the size of what we are now. But I tell them this, but we were a mile wide and an inch deep. We were just attracting people. We weren't growing people. And it was when I felt like a failure as a pastor. One day I sat with Kathy Copan in a coffee shop and I said, you know what? 
I believe all living things grow, but I believe they grow in different ways. And we're not growing numerically right now, but we're going to figure out how to grow people in their faith. And a quest began right there that is the reason so many of us are here right now. And I began to share that story, and people were getting emotional, and there was just quite a sense of God's Spirit in the room because these were people at the beginning of their journey, and they were going, this is hard. I'm not sure I can do it. And still yet, even today, every now and again, my best friend will call each other on Monday morning, and, and he'll say stuff like this. He'll say, do not hit send on your resignation letter. <laughs> that I thought would be funnier, too. I, I don't know. <laughs> Some of us are here. Life's hard. You've messed up. Don't quit. Keep going. Some of us are in places right now in our lives with great uncertainty. And here's what I think. The presence of difficulty is not the absence of God. It's the presence of an opportunity. And we need to remember that. I, I, want us to, I want us to look at this just a little bit more closely. Verses four, 3 through 7, look at this. Here's the presence of difficulty. They seized Peter and John because it was evening, put them in jail to the next day. Many who heard the message believed, so the number of men who believed grew. But the next day the rulers and the elders and the teachers of the law met. And Annas the high priest was there, and Caiaphas, John, Alexander, all these in the priest's family. And they had Peter and John brought before them, and they began to question them, by what power or what name did you do this? And they asked these guys where they get the power to say what they say and do what they do, and they recognized that here in front of them is, is a guy that's been healed by what they say and do, and they don't like it. Here's what I want to ask everybody in the room. When was the first time you figured out not everybody in your world wants you to do better? Right? Not everybody is out for your success. And we need to remember that. I think this, everybody likes change until something changes. <laughs> right? I had some lady tell me last night already, somebody at Good Shepherd, that Hates me already. <laughs> Probably shouldn't have said that. It's all right. Won't, won't, won't be the last time either. We have to learn to embrace the customary tension that accompanies our life. Here's a law of the universe. All motion creates friction. We have to know that. So here's what I want to tell you in the presence of, the, of difficulty. Lean into it. Lean into it. I remember a story. A pastor I know had a little girl's daughter. She was, she was a little pistol, I'm telling you. And she was learning how to ride her bike on her training wheels. Some of you all maybe have heard this. And he took her out at the front yard and he said, now Mallory, he said, here's the zone I want you to stay in, okay? So there's the neighbor's sidewalk. Do you, do you, do you see their driveway? Yes, Daddy, I see the driveway. You cannot, don't go past the driveway. Took her over here, and he said, do you see this tree in the corner of our yard? Yes, Daddy, do not go past the tree. So here's the zone. You have their driveway. You have the tree. If you go outside of those boundaries, you're going to get a spanking. She looked right up at, at him, and she said, you better spank me now. i got places to go. <laughs> Wow. And in that moment, he learned he had a leader in the house. Paul was speaking one time, and uh, he said about his most difficult situation real quickly. He said this, For when we came into Macedonia, we had no rest, but we were harassed at every turn. There were conflicts on the outside. There were fears within. But God who comforts, look at this, who comforts a downcast, Comfort us by the coming of Titus, and not only by his coming, but also by the comfort you had given him. He told us about your longing for me, your deep sorrow, your ardent concern for me. 
so that my joy was greater than ever. I think about that sometimes when we're going through conflict and we're going through difficult experiences in our life. We have fears within. I had a friend who said one time, fear, fear is the dark room where negatives are developed. Isn't that great? Fear is the dark room where negatives are developed. Paul says, we had, I had fear within. And then he said, I, I had fights without. It was tough. But God was there. In the presence of other people, he brings comfort. He brings strength. So here's the thing I want to say real quick. The presence of difficulty is always in our story. And that leads us to this other point I want to say. There is within it the potential for courage. I really believe in my heart, there are many of us in this room that the Holy Spirit would say to you, rise up, have courage. The absence or the presence of difficulty does not signal my absence. It signals the opportunity that is in front of you to have courage. Do you know that one of the, the most often requested things in the Bible by God to his people is that we might have courage. Isn't that interesting? He doesn't say give up. He doesn't say shrink back. He doesn't say avoid the hard thing. He says have courage. Uh, we've made a list. Trevor and I made a list the other day. Joshua, Moses, Isaiah, uh, Isaiah the disciples. Paul twice in dreams was asked by God to have courage. Have courage. I'm involved. I'm there. I'm with you. I, I think there's great courage here. I just love Peter because I feel in so many ways we're all like him. One minute he's red hot, the next minute he's such a coward, right? And in that, do you feel like, is that your life or is that only mine? You're, some of you are looking at me, that's only you. I don't know. Um, look at what happens here. So they said, by what power? And then look at it. Watch this. This is awesome. Don't miss it. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, hey, rulers and elders of the people, if we are being called to account today for, for uh, an act of kindness shown to a man who was lame, who's being asked how he was healed, then know this. You and all the people of Israel, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. Jesus is the stone you builders rejected. Don't you think that would have been a moment when he was going to John, hey, let's go easy on this or we might get in trouble. <laughs> right? Just like, you know, don't you imagine it would have been very easy for him to go, hey, I got this. Let's just try to take the sting out of the room. What does he do? punches him right in the face, right? Did you see, read the story this week of the, the girl that got attacked by the alligator? And she stuck her fingers right in his nose. And he let go. That's what Peter's doing right here. He's sticking his finger in everybody's nose. Okay? Some of you need to get in your car and make a phone call and stick a finger in someone's nose. No, I didn't say that. It was a late night. The potential for courage. Can I make a confession? I've learned way more about myself in the moments of difficulty than in the fields of peace. It's when the storms have come in my life that I've actually learned where my character needed to change, where my faith needed to grow, where my trust deepened. And in those moments, I will tell you, that's when God becomes real to you. A faith that is never tested isn't worth anything. And some of us right now, we're, we're in We're in battle. We got some stuff. And I want to tell you, here's what Jesus is saying to you by his spirit. The presence of difficulty does not mean I've abandoned you. It presents an opportunity for you to have courage. And you will grow. 
I had a friend of mine when I was growing up, and we became very fast friends. Frankly, this was at Good Shepherd, and we were just growing in our faith together. And we would read things sometimes together in the Bible. When we, we would go to the beach, and we would surf a lot, and we'd take our Bibles. We were kind of like surf nerds. And, um, and we would read stuff in the scriptures with one another, and then we, would, we, always, we had a saying that we would offer to one another when it was just difficult or it was a little in our business, and we would say, that's a hard teaching, who can accept it? And that was our little thing we would say to each other, and we'd read something, and court, my friend, would look at me and he'd go, man, that's a hard teaching, who could accept that? And I'd read something, and we'd go, that, I'd go, that's a hard teaching, who can accept that? And it was just our little way of saying, this is, we need to do this. It's getting real in here. And that's where so many of us are, are on this Mother's Day. God is powerful. He is real. And he wants to meet you right where you are and move you forward in faith. Don't resist his prompting, and his leading. Would everybody stand with me in this room? We'll do this every now and again. We'll just extend our hands. It's a customary way that we're just saying, God, I'm open. It's not going to get weird. So let's go to prayer. Here we are, Lord, as your people. We ask in the name of Christ that you might fill us with your spirit. And right now, Lord, with our upturned hands, what we're doing is we're releasing to you our burden, our struggle, our difficulty, our challenge, our conflict, our question, our doubt. And we want to receive from you now faith and hope and perseverance and joy and healing and direction and wisdom and grace because we need all of these things oh God if we are to live our lives in ways that honor you because here's what we would all say we're unschooled ordinary people But we pray that people might be able to look at us and say, we have been with Christ. This is our prayer, and we offer it in the name of Christ. And everyone said, amen. Go in his peace. Happy Mother's Day. See you next weekend.